All righty, let's get let's get cracking. Just make sure. <laughs> All righty, let's get let's get started. We've got Mike here. Uh, we're going to be talking today about scaling the team by one hundred and twenty percent from thirty nine to ninety five people. I'm sure those numbers have changed <laughs> somewhat, but we'll we'll use it as a starting point. There's a lot <laughs> like there's one one number moving to a much bigger number. Of, of uh, people in the team we're going to go through all, all the different things that that happen with that ho hopefully if you've got questions pop them in the chat uh so just just quickly a little bit about Terum. we're a tech product development and strategy firm uh we're across kind of the eastern seaboard of australia and, and new zealand we love everything about building tech products that's why we've been running this this cto series um and we love sharing kind of the things we learn that and we love sharing the insights that people we know have learned as well. So a bit about myself, I'm the CEO and founder of Terum. I built the company from sort of nothing to uh, being on the AFR Fast 100 twice. I like my passion is the business of technology from engineering to product, as well as that dirty area that us tech folks often think of of sales. <laughs> I love seeing it all come together to build businesses and then in in my kind of fun time love making sausages sailing boats american barbecue these are my favorite favorite kind of activities always happy to talk about those as well um and we've got mike from octopus deploy with us so M mike uh started his career with boeing which i actually want to dig into a little bit before we get into scaling this team but um he has worked in a bunch of roles but really i think at Octopus for a while now, building the team out. And Octopus, for those that don't know, is a, a uh, deployment tooling for continuous integration, helps you do your builds, releases. And um, the I think what's really important as well in the context of our conversation is recently, you know, they were bootstrapped and then have took on a, I think it's $200 million round of funding or, or thereabouts. And they're, they're kind of the, uh, the fuel the rocket fuel has been poured onto the fire. <laughs> and so they gotta they gotta go. And that's that's what we're gonna be touching on. But but before we do, I always like to to ask kind of get a bit of a sense of the person. So Mike, you're saying music is your other passion. Hey everyone, good to see you all. Yeah, uh, so yeah, outside of the engineering world, I'm probably a bit of a uh, what was called a dark matter developer by some people where when I finish work, that's pretty much it. I'm done. And then I got a big family and I love my music. So yeah, I grew up playing French horn, one of my favorite instruments. I uh, love hearing it when you hear great soundtracks, there's usually a French horn in there somewhere. Uh, and then it was sort of an accident. I got into it because it, it felt like the last instrument that was left when I went to the grade three, try an instrument thing, all the good stuff was gone. And I got this funny curvy instrument, uh, fell in love with it, nearly took it on as a career. And then since then I've been doing singing, music production, piano, uh, mainly. So that's what I do nowadays and, uh, primarily play, uh, in, in a band at my church. COVID made us go online. So now I've actually got YouTube recordings of our music, uh, which is really oh. cool and uh, love it, love sharing it, um, really enjoy playing it. It's my happy place. Yeah, okay. Is this something that's going into the read after material? I don't know, maybe <laughs> if we get a quick link. Yeah, yeah. And so 20, 20 years or so, I've been putting on um, a Christmas show. I started it with a, a friend. And um, it was just like down on a cricket oval in, in a yeah. local suburb. Uh, and we we started it thinking it'd be a couple of hundred people turned up, you know, yeah, about 400 people came and over the years, oh, wow. it about 16,000 uh, until COVID hit. And so we've taken a year or two off, but yeah, my wife does the, all the funding for it and sponsorship and stuff. And then, yeah, we put it on every year. So again, we were forced to record it last year. So I'll probably yeah, share yeah. that video. Mm, good time I, there, is, there, is, time. there is demand, let's call it demand from the, from Moses, as yeah. said, as said hey, Moses. So we've got to share the YouTube channel. Yeah, so, do that after. This is a, yeah, it's a, that's exciting. Um, I, I want to go back to Boeing for a second, oh. if that's all right. Before we jump, so so were you writing software engineer to deploy to hardware? Reading between the lines, like what 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 were you what were you doing there when you started your career? Yeah, right. So four of us got a job out of uh, QUT, Aerospace Avionics Engineering course. Mm. Uh, and I, I played the game right, got the job. 
Uh, and two of them wanted to draw lines on paper that said where wires go in the aircraft. So that was called systems engineering. And then I got one of these leftover software engineering jobs, having only written a few lines of software in you know, uni and a few things in past. Uh, and so long story short, yeah, there were five systems on the aircraft from navigation, weapons delivery, mission computer, uh, that uh, we could program. So it might have been a multifunction display and, uh, you know, we, we built paddle pong one Christmas as a bit of a fun thing just yep. to see whether we could actually draw raster graphics. And based on that, we actually built a moving map that the F-111 never would have gotten otherwise. Um, and just a whole bunch of different stuff we did on there. So yeah, navigation, timing, weapons, delivery, displays. Uh, and so that did get built into embedded hardware, you know, mil-spec hardware. Yeah. So what do you think of as as you what what were you writing in assembly c yeah there was uh, a few different languages uh none of those there was one where we had to write some assembly that got uh loaded into like a a prom yeah uh, and then other ones the main language we used was called jovial j73 uh yep. jules his own very interesting abstract language probably made in 1973 uh, and got mil spec somehow. And that was global variables, a hard real time operating system. Uh, a build of the mission computer took four hours. Uh, had some unit testing. Um, we tried to make it faster through some grid computing that, you know, some of the more senior engineers put in place. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Fast forward to JavaScript. Right. <laughs> How does JavaScript make you feel emotionally? <laughs> How does JavaScript make me feel emotionally? <laughs> As a, as a former like hard, yeah. system, let's call it like low level uh, software engineer, where you're yeah. thinking about like if I've got an extra bit that I'm yeah. using, that's like I'm. Um, really second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about JavaScript? <laughs> I I feel I honestly feel happy. I, I think I, I think I should. It's kind of put pro, that's what put programming in the hands of so many people. Having a chat last night about Fox Pro sort of did that democratized programming. We saw many yep. businesses built on Fox Pro. Um, yeah, so JavaScript, I don't know, it makes me happy. It's kind of like the plucky language that definitely could and took the world by storm. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so far, fast forwarding, yeah. um, fast forwarding to, to Octopus and you you had to take the team from, uh, I, get, I guess, was it a bit, maybe not steady state, but like or, kind of organic growth where you were adding things you know, I suppose a, a bit of a manageable fashion to then all of a sudden, and that might not be characterizing it properly. So just, just, okay. just wasn't. And then you kind of gone from now we're just going to have to step change the team in quite a dramatic fashion. Tell me about about the beginnings of that. Were you involved in the in the in the process of planning that when you were going for the fundraise, or did the CEO walk in and just go, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Guess what you're doing next month? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I joined, there was about ten people, and we were shipping Octopus 3.0, and the world, you know, we'd sort of stopped the world to get that out the door. And I joined at around the hardening phase. We we're trying to get it ready to go out the door. Uh, through to, I guess, part of my first mission was to help Paul, the founder, have a holiday because he hadn't taken a holiday in a long time, and so yep. build the confidence that we'd be able to do that as a team, and he'd go away and he'd have a clear head. Uh, through to, I guess, three-ish years of organic growth, just growing slowly. Uh, I think what happened was we, I don't think we quite realized how much of an ecosystem we built and then kind of left alone. And then we go and build new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. And I don't think we counted the cost enough of what maintaining that stuff yeah, meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were sort of finding ourselves in a position where we could keep the lights on and we could ignore a whole bunch of stuff and move the thing forward a bit strategically. Um, and then we were talking about, you know, we really do need to grow our team in order to, if we really want to do, the know, do everything, yeah. like, you're never going to be able to do everything, but just be able to maintain the things and then keep one or two big threads moving forward. Yeah. Um, but we didn't really want to have a big team. Like it wasn't, wasn't really part of the, the mission. We wanted to have a nice company to work at, a bit of a lifestyle company, love working there. I think what happened is it just, it kind of got out of our control. And so what I mean by that is that a few things all came together. Like you said, um, I had nothing to do with the fundraise. Actually, it wasn't even a proactive fundraise. Um, you know, VC companies and, and acquirers have been coming to Octopus for year on year. Yeah. Um, and so I think finally Paul 
uh, saw, and I'm telling a story that I'm not 100% sure of, but, you know, yeah, saw, yeah, yeah. saw the opportunity and then thought, look, you know what, this can put me in a position where we don't need to run the company super conservatively. We now have the chance to really run harder to the line as far as profit goes and build the company. And the reason for that, you know, step change was really the recognition of the problems that we wanted to solve, the recognition that if we wanted to keep working at a company that we love working at, you don't want to fade into obscurity, right? While other competitors are coming in that market and trying to take it. So when it comes to enterprise software, we've seen a pattern that it's, you know, the winner takes all the spoils. Uh, and so we've had a head start, but we needed to make sure we didn't take the pedal off, uh, you know, foot off the pedal. It was actually, no, we need to increase our velocity to not only maintain our market share and profitability, it's really to keep driving at it. So we've had, uh, as a company, there's open blog posts about this. We've had 40 to sometimes 60% year on year growth in ARR, mm -hmm. uh, annual recurring revenue, um, and in customer base and things like that. We needed to keep that going. And our intent is, uh, you know, four to five years, maybe there's a, um, an IPO or something like that at the end of the story, um, working towards that um, you know, billion dollar company type thing, uh, valuation. Uh, long story short, to be a great company to work at, we realize we have to win our market. And so that's why the, the step change and yeah. why we went really hard after that. And, and that story you told of not realizing the maintenance support cost is an interesting one that, I mean, I've definitely learned and you don't, you don't always factor it. You know, you think, oh, there's this cool new thing, we'll add it. But every little thing you add, right, like just adds, it always needs a bit of, as someone, as a, as a serial founder once put to me, is like software always needs constant tending. Yeah. Constantly tending the garden. When you put stuff out there, you got to look after it. If you've got yeah. customers using it, right? So yeah. I completely understand that one and then that means is you know you get you go to sit down and you're like all right we're going to start the sprint um in in real day-to-day -day form we're going to start the sprint but then you got this like oh no but one of our customers has just said feature x needs a bit of a oh, but we've got to do that big strategic thing we were working on which one are we going to pick yeah um so i can i can really kind of visualize exactly what what you're you're going through there so okay mm -hmm. so we got the picture ready to go, the funding's come in. Um, yeah, what, what did you do next? So the funding's come in, what was your next yeah. step? I think, I think certainly within the engineering team where we saw how aggressively we wanted to grow, mm. uh, I think we all, you know, started sweating a bit and maybe <laughs> crying in the corner, honestly. <laughs> None of us had ever been through a rapid scale up like this before. Um, yeah. And we didn't know what was gonna happen as we embarked on that. So I think it was just take a moment, take a breath, make sure we were all on board, you know, for the ambiguous adventure of what was coming up. Uh, and then I think we just turned the taps on and, and ran. Uh, and so we had a lot of things in place already that I think have really helped us actually scale and not, you know, just implode or lose everybody on the way through. Yeah. And we can talk about those, uh, those things if we want to. Yeah. Um, and as we open up the taps, I guess then there was a whole lot of, uh, I don't know, lack of mastery. Like I said, none of us had done it before. So in a company doing a lot of things for the first time, there are a lot of us doing things for the first time, which meant that we were generally incompetent at them. And the time difference between incompetence, realizing you made a mistake, correcting for the mistake, and then you know wrapping that learning into the organizational structure or whatever it is, yeah, um, it, that's that's what this entire last what nine, ten, eleven months has been. It's just rapidly iterating on that. Yeah, and and especially when you've got, you know, when you go from that founder-owned organic style growth to VC money in goals on the table you know timelines around ipos being thrown about the pressure kind of steps up like time becomes the the critical factor is definitely what i've seen yeah happening. right yeah we've sort of had that and sort of not uh, yeah. I, i've seen it leak in a little bit i think one of the major differences is octopus as a company has been profitable since day one Whereas many companies that are going from funding round to funding round are kind of beholden to those funding yeah, rounds yeah, 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 yeah. as well as to get the next one. We're actually not in that position at all. This, this 
funding has really just said, we've got something of worth here. And yep. now we've got a, a a better war chest and less risk, right? We have a, a higher appetite for risk, knowing that the probability of things going wrong is much lower than it was before. So that's that's, that's an interesting difference that I've noticed, not having gone through other you know VC startups before myself. Yeah, just recognizing there's something unique here. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And and so so you got the phone, you got everyone together. You were talking about there were some things that helped would be great to, you know, what helped yep. you that was in place? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I've got to try to remember, you know, am I going to get the right top three? I'm probably not. <laughs> Just the things that come off the top of their head and, and you know, in an afternoon chat, uh, I think we, one of the, one of the first ones I'd say is that we had a, a lot of longevity in our crew. So starting at the the one, the two, the three, all the way through to the 10, so many of those people are actually still with us. Uh, and key leadership that I guess we'd built into, you know, the depth and the breadth of that leadership and the and the depth and breadth across the teams meant we were able to make a bit of a manoeuvre, <laughs> spit up some teams and then grow into those teams uh, with strength already there. I think because we'd held off growing so much, we were we were ripe for it. Yeah. So that was, that was really good in that way that you had people that had been there for a really long time, um, knew the company really well. That was a good foundation to build on. Uh, but we got to a point now at the end of the year where two thirds of the people <laughs> in the company or in, in the, uh, so the R and D team, or the engineering team are actually new, you know, are under a year. Yeah. Um, so now we're at a bit of a different point where we're thinking about next year as well. How do you keep building that? So that, that helped us a lot. Another thing, and I'll rattle some off really quickly without going into yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it. Um, culture, really huge thing we believe in very strongly, um, is that. Uh, we wrote, we'd, we'd worked for years on what culture we wanted to have because we were building this lifestyle company. And a lot of it honestly comes from Paul. Then there's other influences like me uh, and other early people in the company that said, we want this company to be a great place to work, not just to get the tick box, but for it to be actually as true as we could make it. And so we worked on these things, uh, introducing, um, you know, things like Radical Candor, by, you know, the book by Tim Scott. Um, and other influences around the place is one of the key influences um, to just make this company we want to work at. And then we actually went to the effort to take all the stuff that we'd done and written down internally and turn it into a company handbook, which we published publicly. Yep. Uh, and it turns out that, that when people are interviewing at Octopus, that's probably the number one statement we hear from 80, 95% of the people. Yep love the handbook right and then they'll ask the question of how much of that is aspirational how much of it is real yeah, yeah. And because we'd spent the time baking it in and writing it internally and then trying to hold ourselves accountable to it yeah, yeah we generally yeah. say that look all of it is as true as we can make it and yeah there's some things there that are aspirational but we keep working towards them so handbook culture longevity of the people um oh gosh having the money available <laughs> let's be honest right it I've, I've worked in companies where there was no headroom to hire. So you just can't having the ability to be able to do that. Uh, was really strong. Um, I guess having a product and a company that was worth working at too, like we were able to get a pretty good, um, branding out there and pretty good awareness and yeah. being Australia, New Zealand, we got a lot of influence there. And as we started to ask people, you know, would you like to come and work for octopus one day? And their, their eyes are lighting up saying, what me, you know, which is, which is really lovely to hear. Yeah. And, and to just the, um. I think the, the longevity thing's interesting around the team and how you use that. I'd love to just dive, dive a bit deep on, sure. on that one a bit. So it, could you talk through what, what that meant in, in like practical terms? So when you're sitting there going, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from how many teams did you have? Maybe like three or four? I'm just guessing. Yeah. At that time, we had four teams. Yep. And, and what was the step between, and I now need, 10 teams or whatever, what was the number you kind of? Yeah. So we, we kind of used a bit of Dunbar's numbers and, you know, yeah. some really good influence. Um, pardon me. One of the books uh, is called scaling teams mm -hmm. and that, that helped us kind of rationalize. There's these constraints that help you understand what great team sizes and what, you know, having a clear mission, long-term missions. Uh, so we talk about the question was really around how do you think about these longevity of people and the teams. So given the numbers, we're thinking mm, might end up with six, seven, eight teams. And then we've got to think about, well, who do we need in those teams and what do we want them to do? And, 
and logically, uh, I guess there's something we can dig into as well is this is lag factor between when you hire people and when, you know, there's a bit of a dip in productivity on the team because they're onboarding people. Um, and then, you know, eventually the person becomes net productive and then the whole team's becoming more productive, but then you probably hire somebody else. Yeah. Um, and so we've noticed this really interesting lag factor. Let's call it six months. Yeah. Um, before we scale up. So then we're thinking, okay, well, there's a constraint and the number of leaders we've got a constraint and the way we can split teams off to be independent due to architectural concerns. There's another constraint, right? So looking at all those different constraints, um, the fact that we had some people that had been there for a while meant we could take some more risks again about spinning up a new team to go and do something uh, because we had existing people there and they could pretty much start, hit the ground running. Yep. as long as the architecture supported it. And so that's what we tried to marry up was a few teams where we could start up with the architecture we think supported it well. Um, long story short, one of those teams has done really well. Um, the other one has struggled and that's not the team's fault. We realize on retrospect, there's a whole bunch of things that went into that not going awesome yet. The intent is for it to go awesome. And some of that is around clarity of you know mission and um, just yeah, a bunch of different things in there. But I don't know if I've answered your question specifically because it's a bit broad, but you know, no, no, that, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's great. Like, and so, um, you know, the leaders for those teams, did they come from? They, it sounds like they came from existing people that maybe put yeah. their hand up, or yeah, yeah, in many ways, um, some people already, you know, stepping into leadership roles in other places uh, in the company. Uh, in some cases, we've been really lucky and that we've uh, and tried hard <laughs> to be able to hire in some leaders that, that are seasoned uh, yeah. and. You know, have a good interview process in place there and um so we've got yeah a certain amount of the leadership has come from those people that were there before uh we've certainly uh, and there's a couple of different podcasts going around about this now as we we had a bit of an identity crisis around do we want engineering managers like more people delivery focused managers to be a complement to tech people or do we want to go for the unicorns all the time that can kind of do it all but recognize they can only focus on so many things at once. Yeah, and so yeah. we've, we've gone wholesale into, through this period of growth, investing in engineering management, you know, people management and, uh, and delivery management as kind of this real strength. Um, and early days, yeah, but we are seeing the early signals that that's actually playing in our favor as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, so, to, so it sounds like, so these are kind of the things that were in place that helped you saying, so the culture, and then you start thinking about how yeah. to, what what were the you mentioned some of the constraints like yeah what were some of the things that um held you back initially maybe that you had to overcome in in scaling the team up yeah yeah <laughs> i think about it this way in a hand wave is that all the way from the life cycle of somebody finding out about the company through to being really productive in the company. And then eventually yeah. like with safe exits, if that's the case. Yeah. And you draw a line along there, there's a lot of dot points along that line where there's, you know, we found there's bottlenecks. And uh, so starting at the very beginning was we've, we had some pretty good job ads in place. We, um, however, to, to grow that many people, as in we were just saying, hey, we're here come and find us if you find us and we'll interview you. And we just took care of that way to immediately switching across to our, we're going to headhunt people and we're going to source you know, passive candidates. And, and so moving from an organic turn up at the door, hi, let's meet you an interview process to a sourcing process. Yeah. Uh, that's the number one thing I called out is that that was hard making yeah. that switch. Um, and so we uh, had only just started up a people and culture team and then hired in a talent acquisition manager. Uh, and they've been great and we've all worked really well together, um, but we had to learn a lot along the way. Yeah. Uh, things like how to think about headcount and budgeting and how to sequence hiring plans and just so much stuff along that path um, through to us letting go of a lot of the hiring process and focusing more on the interviews themselves um, through to having a big enough interview pool to once we finally say yes, how are we going to allocate people to the best team at the best time. So that became something we had to solve through to making sure everybody that they walked through the door had the best chance at onboarding um, and making sure, yeah, we do that. And we're still, you know, wrestling through improving that process today. So there's some examples. Yeah. yeah also, it's really interesting. You mentioned a lot of the recruiting process. How, how did you find that it also impacted the teams? Um, I hate, like I'm not a big fan of focusing on output, but like at the end of the day, 
someone needs to write a line of code in order for code to be deployed. So you've got yeah. to output something. Um, you know, how did that impact the team's ability to get, you know, support support customers, ship the big threads that you said you're working? Like, yeah. Yeah, how did you balance that with with hiring? Yeah, so I guess that's a piece of the engineering management investment was yeah. that we we started looking at a few people to be running partners for me because I was getting overwhelmed with the work, honestly. Because uh, I tried to take on a lot of that, let's set up these really scalable, sustainable, humane systems so that other people can focus on what their best contribution is an octopus. Uh, so a couple of people became running partners for me. Um, their names are Trish and Roy. And they started to take some of that load around, okay, I'm going to own the whole tech career pathway from introduction and branding all the way through to safe exits and career promotion, all that sort of stuff. Uh, same with Roy, um, I'm oh, sorry, Trish took on the engineering management pathway and then they became the custodians of those things so that other people who would have historically done some of that stuff could focus on getting the job done. So we, we shared the load a little bit. Uh, as far as interview pools go, we made sure that people had the ability to say how many interviews a week they'd like to do. And we got tooling. That's a pretty cool tool that we use called GoodTime uh, for that one. Uh, and that automatically is like a lot of the hardship and toil of organizing interviews is just taken care of by this tool once you set it up right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we found that was really good that teams or people, sorry, interviewers could sort of dial that up and down depending on their needs at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then optimizing that flow a bit. Um, but you're talking about, yeah, how do people keep getting the job done while I do this? Uh, you know, honestly, it has had a hit. We, we can see it, not perfectly, um, because yeah. we don't have awesome ways of tracking everybody's work, right? We don't do timesheets or anything like that. But there's this sense of, yeah, it does have an impact when you're busy hiring, interviewing, onboarding, training, and then loop repeat. Yeah, how many yeah. people you got coming in your team? It does have an impact. So we asked each of our teams to think about their hiring plan and not say, "I'm going to hire ten people in Q1." Can't do it, um, right? And they can't onboard that many people. But it's really about how can we onboard somebody new, make sure they've got a great mentor and a buddy, help them be productive, nice and quick. How many of those can we do each quarter? Maybe one or two, and then stagger that out like that so that the team can continue to, I don't know, do a bit of everything. And how, how do you, you mentioned that the teams are owning their their plans. Is that where the, the engineering manager, delivery manager is kind of coming into it? Are they looking at, all right, what what are we going to ship next quarter and the quarter yeah. after? What does that mean for our team? Do we think we've got the capacity or is that something that you're kind of doing or how, how's that working? Yeah, so uh, we with the engineering manager, they're one person. They just, um, there's an interesting article around by a person called Pat Kewer called, um, uh, what is it, engineering manager archetypes. And I thought it was a nice way to describe uh, these different archetypes of engineering manager, which helped us understand, you know, why some of us are wearing all of those hats and responsibilities were struggling with the job and struggling with the idea yeah, yeah. of what we call an anemic people manager. And so, um, yeah, our engineering manager is kind of a, one of the, a bit of a blend between the archetypes of real focus on pre people, career growth, all that thing. They're quite technical people. Um, and then as well as being great at delivery, right? So being able to marry those two together. And so they're thinking holistically about what mission are we on? What is our team trying to achieve? Um, which people do we need to onboard when in order to build a team that we need to deliver the things? Yeah. And so with all of those married together with the constraints of our, we've only got three people on our team right now. We can't onboard six people, right? We've got to, We've got to slow that down. So using all of those constraints, they build a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess at the at the high level where I'm at, we're really thinking about what are the company's priorities? What are our product strategy priorities? How do we scale up the right part of the organization to hit those at about the right time? And then you marry the two together and you do a bit of negotiating around it. Um, it's I've made it sound way too easy. Um, and we didn't do a great job at it in 21, certainly done a better job in 22, or we've, we've certainly tried harder, um, but it's been a lot less stressful than it was in 21. Yeah. 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 So we've got a pretty solid plan for Q1 and then we sort of just roll it out as we go through the year. Yeah. And it is it kind of iterative? You're finding like you, you're tweaking it as you, as yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah, and I talk about quarters like we've been planning quarterly for a while. We didn't. Um, this is something new that we've jumped into this, you know, literally this last few weeks, 
as a company has gone, oh, there's too much ad hoc planning and people don't know quite when to listen and interact with each other. Yeah. And so we just made a, a call, quarterly planning, monthly checkpoints. It's predictable. It's a busy point in time, but let's just try to have something really predictable and calm and ordered that everybody can you know, interface with. Uh, so yeah, and our prediction, well, in 21, yeah, there was a lot of iteration because we we're learning on the fly. In 22, we're hoping to more turn that iteration into something that happens quarterly. And we're thinking forward, uh, sort of like laying the train track six months in advance. Yeah, yeah really, really interesting. And and just um, we haven't touched on it. I want to make sure we do. The, you mentioned also the constraint around architecture. Oh, yeah. I remember you saying in one of our earlier chats that like you, 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 you had a monolith. Still do. Yeah. And then, which isn't necessarily a bad thing the way that people often go like, oh, monolith bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've come to learn it's sometimes good. Um, depend so talk, I'd love you to talk a little bit about how you've thought through that as a constraint and how you're thinking about it going forward. Cause it's a situation that I think almost everyone scaling up often finds themselves in. Yeah. Yeah. And Gee, I'd love to be able to say, we've written the book on how to do it. Well. <laughs> but I, I tell you, it is, it is a seriously complex area. And so one of our, our I'm going to project there, our gut reactions is it is drive towards, um, I don't know, I'm older, so service-oriented architectures, like they can be really great. Uh, so microservice like, yeah, we're going to go all in on that. No, that's yeah, just yeah. not the right timing for us and may never be. And some of the interesting constraints there for us is we are primarily a self-hosted product today still. That's where so much of our revenue comes from. And one of the things that we just keep getting told is the upgrade process for Octopus is so easy because mm -hmm. it's monolithic. It's just one yeah, thing. Yeah. And the installation process is so easy because it's just one thing. You don't have to stand up many external dependencies like a database maybe some file storage, it supports high availability, those kind of things. And it's, it's pretty simple. So that's a constraint. That's something we don't want to move too far mm -hmm. away from. And there might be a future where, you know, there's a, there's a turnkey Kubernetes style installation for people who want to run that kind of thing on their yeah. cluster. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's a constraint. And then there's pieces around, um, you know, the, where, what can we, I guess this is how we're thinking about a lot is we're looking for those fracture planes, either in the organization or the architecture, where we say, this just makes sense. And if we get the chisel and we tap away a little bit, it comes away neatly mm -hmm. and allows a team and that code to be iterated on and to have autonomy and mastery, right? Clarity. So that's one of the teams where I said that worked really well is that I uh, called our steps team. And within Octopus, if you can just imagine for a second, you've got a whole bunch of steps that you write down that you say, this is how I deploy my application. And each of those steps, we love it when there's a, when we take load off the person who's writing the process and we do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. So it's opinionated by default, flexible under the hood. We have these first class steps, but you can always fall back to scripting if you want to. Uh, and the intent there is that we want to have a bunch of steps that are, that cover the most important um, and, and parts of the landscape for hosting applications. And we know we're probably going to have a hundred of them that we curate and take really good care of and fashions change, right? We want to support 10 years worth of all those amazing applications that are out there. The companies are still maintaining through to the you know, serverless uh, container style deployments today. Um, how do we do that? Right. And we want to do it in a way that we can iterate on those quickly without having to change the core infrastructure. We haven't been able to do that until this year, uh, just gone, where we invested in that, we, we got the chisel out, we chipped away uh, and built up after years of making mistakes trying to do it. We've finally reached a point where we're really proud of the steps framework we've got. And it means that in one or two weeks, a small team of developers can build a brand new technology specific step, away we go. So we've carved out like this, this whole section of Octopus is really important to us into something that is not a microservice and it doesn't need to be a microservice. It's just at the right fracture point architecturally, but there's other parts of Octopus, like a, I'll say a word like dynamic workers. That's something that is a microservice and it already is. So what we're looking at there is don't look at monolith and say, must carve up the monolith at all costs. It's let's look at what we have in our landscape. Let's look at what we want the uh, you know where the uh, volatility boundaries might lie or where we want to be able to scale differently 
and let's carve those pieces out and do the right thing with them outside the monolith, but keep the monolith as it is where it's still, you know, either really beneficial to us or really expensive for us to change and the ROI is not there. Yeah. 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 And do you, in, in real practical terms, is everyone committing to the same uh, Git repo? Is that bad? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes no, we have hundreds of Git repos. Yeah. And honestly, be real transparent. Sometimes they're helping us, sometimes they're hurting us. Yeah. We carved some things out into independent repos where we thought these things are will will rarely ever change. So let's put them out separately and test them independently. And it turns out that history has told us that almost every one of them had to change. And the <laughs> cost of changing them and then rolling those through was costly. And it's hurting us more than hindering us, especially because we have three release branches that we support for um, critical vulnerabilities and things for customers where they want that low risk yep. kind of support from us. So then it multiplies by three and the complexity grows. So um, yeah, we're in the middle of just doing enough research to figure out where can we and should we bring some things back into the, uh, yeah, call it a mono repo. Yep. Where do things exist really well outside? What's the balance between all of them? Um, so I guess the long story short there is, there's so much it depends and there doesn't seem to be just a one size fits all. Um, and our approach really to it has been, look for the, look for the ROI. You know, look for the changes we need to make learn the lessons too don't just stick with something dogmatically because it was a good decision three or four years ago has tooling has the ecosystem changed enough that yeah we don't the the decisions would change if we made them in today's landscape and, and are your teams kind of uh like value focused or feature you mentioned the steps team which is quite an interesting one they've delivered almost a, a mini product itself on top of yeah octopus right like how, how do you think how do you think about your teams have you got ones working on support libraries that own support libraries or am i you know if i was to jump into the octopus code base we well, would probably be pretty worried to start with at the moment <laughs> but like i've encoded for a while but you know am i am i able to go in and just change some of those repos you've spoken about and just submit a chain like a a, a submitted i've forgotten am i able yeah. to commit changes yeah. <laughs> i just don't want to like am i able to put a pull request in yeah. um and commit changes to the code and can i touch any of those repos and just say cool i've finished my end-to-end -end feature off or, or is it like yeah different teams owning it and i've got to i've got to ask mike i've got to say hey mike you own the the um steps repo i need some changes made can you can you make those changes how, how yeah. have you thought about your teams there as you as you especially as you yeah. scale yeah, definitely. One of the driving factors of us hitting that inflection point of wanting to scale up was better ownership. Um, so uh, we were doing some thinking around why is it so hard for new starters to be productive and and soon? Uh, and we had some really senior people uh, that you know, are amazing developers and uh, come from a, a consulting background in some cases where you're, you build those muscles and habits of being able to jetpack in understand context real quick, become really productive really fast. And I was saying, we did it, <laughs> but it was hard. And then we started analyzing, well, why is that the case? And like I said before, we built this ecosystem out without realizing just quite how big it had gotten. And mm -hmm. so a bit of a double-edged sword of the longevity of people at Octopus was, well, many of us knew the whole ecosystem, knew enough about the whole ecosystem to be blind so the fact that new people coming in, when I, I drew this uh, mind map of all of the concepts and things I needed to know about when I joined Octopus. Mm. And it was you know, a non-trivial mind map of stuff. And then I drew it again for 2020 and it was much bigger, you know, yeah. four yeah. to five times as many nodes on that, gra on that graph that I'm not sure if it was the total picture but if we just look at it in terms of a bit of graph theory as well, the amount of things that a new starter had to understand in 2020 is so much bigger, right? 5X. But then you're thinking about the complexity of that as well. It's, I think it's nonlinear. Um, and so what we did then is said, okay, when we scale up, one of the reasons, one of the problems we're trying to solve is mastery and custodianship and long-term ownership. And so we've carved up that map and called it our ownership map. And uh, there's a team called Fire Emotion today that own, they're the owner of un all, all unowned things. And our mission is to try and reduce the number of unowned ah, things yeah. and increase the number of things that are owned by teams. 
But again, it comes with the trade-offs you're mentioning. Yes, a team can start to build mastery in an area and uh, you, know, you might have 10 people working in that area and they become more and more and more experts in that area the longer they work in there. Uh, then you've got the thing about, oh, but should I touch their code or not? Right? And how do I know what their code is? Because it's sort of some of it's in the monolith and some is over here. So that's been an ongoing problem that we're trying to solve. But I'll say this is from a principal's point of view, we're, we're tending more towards ownership rather than lack of ownership, which sounds like a good idea. But then what does that ownership tend to and what practices do we put in place? And so we talk about code tourism, where a team may need to make a change in something that's well owned. And so just like in uh, public uh, libraries, I don't turn up at a public library and just submit a you know, commit code. A, I'm not allowed to. Okay, so then do I just submit a pull request? Well, no, typically library owners will ask you to ask a question first. And then if indeed it's a good idea, feel free to submit a PR and then make sure the PR meets the, you know, the, uh, the bar, right, of that library and then it'll be accepted. And so we're leaning into that kind of approach internally is, hey, go and ask the question of the experts in that area. And if they're not experts yet, help them build the expertise and then, you know, follow that kind of approach of ask question first, yes, submit a, a pull request and, and meet the bar of that area. Yeah. How, how do, how's that working in terms of dependencies? Because you start, you, you're kind of then creating more dependency, right? Like if you've got, oh, well, I've got, for me to get my thing done, I'm waiting on team B to do yeah. their thing, I, I, which you get good ownership, but then you, you the trade-off is the dependency problem. Yeah, exactly. How are you thinking <laughs> about that? Yeah, uh, managing it over time. Yeah. <laughs> and so I guess really we're just looking for where the problem sources come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there are cases where uh, this is one of the reasons why we're trying to get better at planning is because then you can detect those dependencies earlier. Yeah. Right? And then sequence the work potentially in such a way or teams can say, whoa, whoa, whoa that, that thing you want to achieve sounds amazing but we understand the code well enough to know that we're going to be tripping over each other if we're working in this same space. So that's a, I guess, a nature of the lack of autonomy or the, you know, the lower levels of autonomy you get from being in the architecture we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to work around it somehow. And I guess that's why, why I say we're managing it is we're yeah. just looking for where those problems come up and then figuring out without an entire rewrite, right, today, mm -hmm. which would take years anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure do, right, is to find the ways to lower the pain right that's involved in it um, and so in some cases we're nailing it in other cases we're not and then we're it's, dealing with it all the time there's probably tricky parts of the system right like some pieces yeah. are probably easier and others are a bit more yep any system that's been worked on for that length of time that's that's some spaghetti ish hundred <laughs> percent areas that are, are hard to do to, to even if you're not physically breaking it apart breaking yeah. it apart in a in, in the way you're managing it and working with it since. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you're hitting on absolutely one of the key problems that we find ourselves faced with weekly almost. Yeah. Is that is that the key constraint? So you mentioned high, like coming back to our broader topic, yeah. we've got architecture and and hiring really and a bit of team design, but like it, are those the two constraints? Is there, is there something else you've found that you've had to work through? Yeah, uh, so they are some pretty important constraints. And imagine that our architecture doesn't support lots more people. Something has to change because we just keep yeah, hiring yeah. people and they're all crashing into each other and there's a lot of hardship and toil involved in people's work and then people will leave. So there's definitely constraints in that space that we're trying to address. Um, and yeah, we talked about some of the other ones. Uh, I'm thinking about fairly typical constraints like leadership. Mm. We, we know that we, we don't want to plan something into our roadmap and say, we're guaranteed to hit that in Q2 when there's not already an existing high performance team, possibly already working on that thing. Yeah. So, uh, we, we tame our ambitions, I suppose, by a constraint, which is, do we have people that we can actually say launch a new team by by bringing them across and starting that new team to achieve that thing to achieve that vision or that uh, to run on that mission uh and we know the sacrifice we're making from other teams and they'd be wanting to backfill into that right so it's this complicated kind of interconnected system of constraints and it's usually around leadership 
what people have, do we have available? How long have they been there? Um, if they've only been there for a month, we, you know, they've still got to ramp up and become productive. So yeah. think really carefully about those things. Yeah, interesting. And and it sounds like you're also pulling back on your, your plans a bit, or you're not afraid to pull back on the plans in order to get it right. Like, is that a conscious trade-off of almost like quality over? Because yeah. you, could, you could just do the like, <laughs> keep throwing people, which some some do for speed but it sounds like you're making a bit of a conscious choice yep. is that fair, fair yeah to say? we're definitely definitely making conscious choices and and certainly i hope we're doing a lot better this year than we have oh, sorry 22 right forward looking than 21 yeah because uh, at, at the start of 21 we're all just like i said sweating in the corner freaking just trying to deal with the fact we've got to onboard this many people let alone figure out the impact and how we're actually going to track along that mm. once we started seeing that we were actually successful hiring and onboarding all these people we turned very quickly into wow we can get everything done no we can't get everything done no. <laughs> and so we have this fairly common saying that i'm a big proponent of is you can dream faster than you can build and we've seen that year on year on year at octopus um, and so we've got high conviction around some things that we really really want to do and we know they're validated through the fact that we've got 25,000 ish customers that have been telling us for years, they love that thing. And we're just desperate to do the thing. And we don't have to do that much validation around it. We're just waiting on the right time where we can say it's time to launch that now. Yeah. Um, and we want to launch it with a team that can actually do the job, not just throw people at it and hope, yeah. it, right, hope it goes well, but while also recognizing those people have got to come from somewhere. Yeah. And, and, and um, just a, kind of a last question or two from me, and then um, I, I'd love to open it up to everyone on the call to, to throw yeah. questions at you. So just uh, please, if you're listening in, like jump on the chat. Jump, the Q&A is a good one because people can upvote the, the questions, but please jump on and start firing questions away. Um, one, one from me is how, especially with such an engineering-focused product, I'd love to hear about the dynamic between your product organization, your product managers and your engineers um, yep. and how that kind of, cause it's a different dynamic, right? Like the, yeah, <laughs> yeah play, I'd love to I hear can talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cause uh, we were all everything. It's a bit of, I call it our superpower um, that Superman has, you know, a blind spot has a weakness of kryptonite and, or a double-edged sword. It's a little bit like that as in, we are in many ways our own customers. And I know that some of the people in our in some of our other teams will say, but you're not the ideal customer in every case. And I, I completely agree. <laughs> and so that's where the blind spot comes in, is that we in many ways can validate ideas and validate the features and, and stuff as we go, because we use them every day and we want them ourselves. So for many years, and, and this is a, a long way to say, we have only just moved into really in the last year, dedicated like really invested in product management uh, and a, a lot of that was through the recognition of, that we had these blind spots also originally like two years three years ago when we started dabbling into product management we sort of thought that none of the engineers want to be told what to do and we didn't realize that that's not what product managers do yeah yeah uh, great product managers bring context to help make them yeah. the right you know best decision the most timely decisions uh, and that continuous discovery cycle or research with customers. We're yeah. all sitting there as engineers going, we've got to build the thing and we need to talk to customers and help support customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How can we possibly do all of that? And then we realized light bulb, there are people who specialize in doing this, like designers <laughs> and product managers. And so as our teams have started to realize how nice it is, how easy it is to make better decisions when you can ask somebody who's becoming an expert with customers, right, in co-designing um, sometimes, should we do A or B? Let's do A because these reasons. And when we find out that it was a bad choice, let's make the B decision. Uh, so again, long story short, the relationship is uh, an evolving relationship. It's certainly coming from a perspective of, uh, do we even need this? Do we even want this? Through to, uh, oh, I'm starting to see a lot of value when this works well. Mm -hmm. Through to now our team's continuing to raise the bar. Um, but like I said, it was all pretty new this year uh, and that kind of co-designing and co-building and continuous discovery and some of those concepts, they're so new to us. Thankfully, we've got some really great um, product managers, product directors and our VP of product on board now who have really good experience in this space. And we're all busy yeah. saying, 
let's figure this out together. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. I, I guess another part of the scaling story that we there's a there's a question here from Moses, which is uh, what would you say the toughest part of scaling during COVID was, and how did you overcome it? You, you know, probably don't know any other any other. <laughs> No, we don't. Um, yeah. And COVID, see, for us, we were remote first for five or six years. So from that perspective, when before COVID and before hybrid work became so much more popular, that was one of our value props was we're remote first and we do it really well. Um, so thankfully, we didn't have to change anything when COVID hit and lockdowns happened. It was just the rest of lots of other people were getting used to this idea. So now it's kind of becoming so much more table stakes for companies. Mm -hmm. The people in our world, uh, in our in our uh, market are saying, mm -mm, I've had a taste now and I will not work anywhere where I have to go into an office every day of the week. Uh, so we lost a little bit through that, honestly. Lost your edge, um, right. right? Yeah. And then on top of that, the good thing is though, that we're really good at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so there's certain things that with remote work, it actually does take a different skill set uh, and that's we haven't got time to dig into that but through covid no actually a lot of us kind of went everybody's talking about this like it's different <laughs> but it's just normal for us nothing yeah. changed what's going nothing on changed. <laughs> that's yeah. that, thanks for that one and there's one from um from matt here which is what what were the things you did prior to scaling that set octopus deploy up for success so he asked it during when you were explaining some of the reasons. So I'm maybe going to guess that it was like before you set on the journey of scaling, were there some specific actions that you took that helped with the process? Did you, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, did you, did you call up a, some mentors or, or something? Did you, um, I don't know. I'm just trying yeah. to. I, I might, because we did talk about it a bit and I threw some ideas your yeah. way. What I'll do is just list off a couple more. Um, a lot of our senior leaders read like crazy. Yeah. Uh, we connected, we just found connections with other senior leaders in companies that have gone through this kind of thing before. Uh, pretty rare to find, but uh, we had some great connections uh, that we ended up making. And that's, I've, I've found that personally to be really, really good. Uh, just to be able to say, we're having this problem. It's like, ah, oh, yes, yes, I remember having that problem. Or yes, of course you have that problem and we still do like at 600 people or 2000 people uh, it just gets harder so oh gosh okay get ready for that so lots of reading uh making those kind of connections yeah and then uh, some of that i'd put down to God, almost luck around uh we talk about it a little bit like it's riding a tiger uh in many ways this company took control of itself because of the customer base and so yeah we put in a lot of work to make a really great product that we're super proud of and then it just runs away and it's kind of like out of your control. So I, I say it's like riding a tiger because you're just holding on. Yeah. <laughs> and interesting. And I hope you don't get eaten on the way through in a way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awesome. Any, uh, any other questions we've got? We've still got another five minutes of, of Mike's time. So any other questions? My, my one, while uh, anyone's thinking one up, is you mentioned books before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What I did you read? Read? Yeah, what, what, what are the books? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a slide in my Yao presentation on a similar topic where I've got yeah. like nine books in the library that I enjoyed reading. Yeah. Uh, so I listed Radical Candor before by uh, Kim Scott. Uh, I really enjoyed Powerful um, by, hang on, done it. I'm not great with names. Oh, yeah, it's all good if you, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a Powerful yeah. from Netflix, uh, Patty McCord. Um, the other one from Netflix recently by um, Reed Hastings. Uh, what was that called? No Rules Rules. A um, lot of inspiration there. Uh, scaling Up, I mentioned, um, I, is a Matt Gross. I'm not doing too bad with names, hopefully. Yeah. Um, oh, we had a bit of a joke at Yao about any time anybody mentioned team topologies, it was time that was a drinking game. So team topologies, enjoyed that um, and got a lot from it. And again, that, that helped us have a bit of a language and um, set up some criteria around some of the things we're trying out around platform teams. Uh, do, 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 oh, uh, high, high output management, um, from the Intel boss. The original. Ago. That's a bit of a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess there's the flotilla of books around DevOps as well, yeah. that, that is sitting around there. So depending on whether you like novel style, some of those around the unicorn project, DevOps handbook, um, accelerate right. They're becoming 
not only influential at Octopus, um, and they just resonate with all the things I did as a consultant. You go into a company, you go, oh, you don't do continuous integration or deployment and all this other stuff. Let's just do that. You, it's almost money for nothing. Yeah. You, you will not believe how much of an impact that'll make. And so it turns out that that's where a lot of Octopus came from. Um, and then, you know, we're finding, we're having to continually reteach ourselves how to be better at those kind of things. And then the Accelerate book comes out a while ago explaining scientifically why the things we care about actually matter. Yeah, so there's there's a little list. It's but interesting it you mentioned the common language as well, because often it's almost like in some way you want to pick a good framework, but there's a lot of good frameworks for different problems. And sometimes definitely what I observe is like, it's more about having a common framework where when someone says one thing, others understand as you're growing out it across teams, because otherwise you can get into, well, my framework's better than yours or my book's better than yours or saying, yeah. and it kind of, what I've realized is it kind of, to some extent, doesn't matter as long as everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe right. debating why one book's better than another is more about achieving being on the same page than yeah which one's right because often that's they're right yeah. equally yeah. Right. i think that's the thing is after doing the reading and the learning and the talking to people about it you just got to get to a point where you say now i'm going to take those lessons and apply them in context mm -hmm. and then put my own spin on it where it makes sense and so yeah the ubiquitous language uh so important compared or common language right compared to the right language because uh, you i think also we find that we start with the best of intentions and we're solving the problems we see at the time, but then everything changes. And this is why I'm saying, uh, and then new problems arise and the old model doesn't fit anymore. Mm. And so this is actually one of the observations we made, and I see we're running out of time, uh, is that in, because we scaled so quickly and we are continuing to scale, I think this year is 58% growth, so a fair bit slower, but still the same net number of people. Yeah. Um, what we're finding is that the things that worked for us six months ago, don't work for us anymore. And we're hoping that's not always the case, <laughs> but it certainly was an observation we made is I thought we solved that. And then you got yep. to come back and resolve it because just continuing to grow yeah. changed enough of the landscape. Yeah. That was new. Well, Mike, unless anyone's got a last minute question, just thank you so much for, for spending time with us, sharing your story at Octopus. It's been um, I've really enjoyed the conversation and got, got a lot out of it. So I hope everyone else has has as well. Thanks for having it. Thanks for coming in and chatting to us. And a big uh, thank you to everyone for joining us and putting questions up. Um, the, the, we'll, we'll get the books. Uh, the recording will come out. That'll all get emailed out to everyone. Um, and we'll, we'll try and dig up Mike's YouTube uh, music. <laughs> <laughs> If there's any other Christmas carols or but we'll 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 dig that up as well if if we can if if Mike's generous enough to share yes, it. Sure. But um no like re really awesome. Thanks so much Mike and I'm gonna say a big goodbye and end the session. So thanks thanks everyone and uh see you next time. Make sure you subscribe because we're we're gonna have a couple more of these as